So this is interesting stuff to read about. And my favorite journal, maybe it's yours as well, is called the Journal of Agricultural Economics. It's a very kind of <laughs> mainstream. And you learn all kinds of really neat stuff. And there was a piece I was reading the other day. This is how I spend my days. I was reading about um, the trends in meat consumption in, in America and in the world. So basically, it's a very straight line between wealth and meat consumption. The richer a country is, the more protein they consume, and a lot of that protein comes in the form of meat. Now, over time, there has been uh, some shifts, uh, a, a number of different shifts. In the US, we still eat a lot of meat per capita. We're among the world leaders in that. In the old days, uh, pork was number one, then beef. We got really good at raising cattle in this country. Um, we became a big beef exporter and so on. But the big story, and this is what this piece I was reading recently was about, the big story was about the change in trend of that poultry has in this country really caught up to red meat. So that's kind of been the big trend line over the past 40 or 50 years is poultry has essentially caught up. And as I'm reading about the trend lines here, you know, chicken is obviously a huge, um, a huge piece of that story. There are many interesting wrinkles in there. Chickens used to be considered kind of, believe it or not, they were kind of almost waste meat. They were, chickens were good animals to make eggs, which we like, but the chickens, like, what do we do with them? Oh, let's eat them. So there's all kinds of weird historical wrinkles. I know in, in Michigan, I know one of the historical wrinkles of food supply is frog's legs used to be a pretty big um, consumption item here, then declined close to zero. Now I understand there's a minor comeback that I gather is kind of boutique-y. But anyway, poultry has really caught up with, uh, with red meat in this country. But the secret, the real surprise, is not the chicken anymore. That's been around a long time. It's, it's turkey. So it used to be um, that we really only, we ate very, very little turkey in this country, but now that's given a lot of um, ammunition to the, the poultry uh, category overall. And the, the rise happened because it used to be we would just roast turkey for the big holidays, but then for taste, but also convenience and also health, people started to eat more and more like turkey sandwiches and so on. And so that's really um, uh, been responsible for turkey, for, for poultry becoming kind of the number one uh, consumption line. Now, I'm reading this article. It's all full of, like I said, pretty interesting things. And then there's one number that jumps out at me um, in this academic article. And if you're like me, sometimes you'll just see one statistic or fact or whatever and it will capture your imagination and you want to know more for whatever reason. So this is what happened to me on this day. I'm reading this article and it said, just as an aside, it said that like 99% of the turkey that's raised for consumption in the United States is the result of artificial insemination. And so my first thought was, um, yuck. Like, uh, even though I grew up on a farm, um, <laughs> I never really thought about turkeys having sex. I don't want to think about turkeys having sex. And now I learn that they're not having sex. <laughs> Why? Uh, inquiring minds want to know. So, so the minute, like I said, when you see one, stati one number, as it's not data, really. It's just a number, OK? For it to be meaningful data, you have to put it in context. So I go look for some context. I go to look up the chicken breeding data. Turns out that the vast majority of chickens bred for consumption mate the natural way. So chickens are essentially having sex. Turkeys are not. Why? Now, this also becomes a justice issue. Poor turkeys. Why, you know, they're, <laughs> they're getting left out. So I'm, again, this is uh, what I do. So I, uh, I get curious, and I start to make a bunch of calls and write a lot of emails. And to make a very long story short, here's the explanation. In the old days, when we were just roasting one or two turkeys per family per year, there was a breed of turkey that was not very delicious. And as more and more people began to eat turkey, American consumer preferences are very strong on the white meat. We like, our, we like white meat turkey in our sandwiches. And so what that led to was the entire industry, the ranchers, the, the, the scientists, on and on down the line, they began to plan for and breed. First of all, they selected a couple different breeds of turkeys that had 
bigger breasts for more, more white meat, and they began to selectively breed those turkeys to have larger and larger breasts so that they would have more and more breast meat for more and more turkey sandwiches. And so, if you had gone to a turkey ranch 50 years ago, you'd have this old kind of flat-chested turkey, let's say Tom, Turkey Tom, come up to flat-chested female turkey, let's call her Jane, whatever, and in the old days, they would come up and kiss. I don't know what turkeys do. They would kiss. They would do their thing naturally. But today, because of our turkey sandwiches and the breeding and these gigantic, they've been bred, male and female, to have these gigantic breasts that the turkeys have such large breasts that they physically cannot get close enough to naturally procreate, thus the need for artificial turkey insemination as an entire industry. This is how I spend my days, okay? <laughs> I tried to warn you, but it, it's pretty grisly. So, 